Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the latest of our French Entree webinars. My name is Zoe Smith. I'm digital editor of French Entree. And in this webinar today, we're going to be talking about buying property in France and moving to France in 2021 and beyond. I'm going to be hosting this webinar for you this morning, and I'm also joined by a panel of experts from our partners at Blevin Franks, Beau Village, and Agence AXA International. And I'll introduce you to them in just a moment. Uh, we're also streaming live to Facebook, so welcome to anyone who is watching us over there. For those of you that aren't familiar with French Entree, we are part of the France Media Group, who are specialist publishers covering all aspects of French life and culture, from travel to gastronomy to, to buying property. French Entree itself has been a leading resource for, uh, leading resource for French property buyers since 2003. Not only do we help buyers to find their dream property in France, we also help and advise with every aspect of the property buying journey. We have a vast network of trusted partners on the ground in France, from real estate agents, mortgage providers, currency exchange specialists, right down to architects, surveyors, removal firms, uh, legal and financial advisors, health insurance providers. Essentially, whatever question you need answering, we can point, point you in the right direction. You may also be familiar with the French Entree magazine, um, we also produce a free weekly newsletter written by yours truly. And if you're not already subscribed to that, you can head over to the French Entree web website after the webinar and uh, sign up for that. And uh, if you're looking to buy property in France, I'd also recommend signing up to become a French Entree member. It's completely free to sign up and it gives you access to some really useful features such as customizable property alerts, uh, as well as free advice from our property team and mortgage advisors. In terms of the content of today's webinar, this is the first of our three-part Destination France webinars, focusing on buying and moving to France in 2021 and beyond. During our last webinar back in March, we received a huge number of questions from attendees. Uh, you were concerned about buying in the current market, about property visits and purchasing during the pandemic, as well as many questions from British buyers about residency and healthcare and moving or retiring to France post-Brexit. And of course, these post-Brexit issues are also issues that affect all non-EU buyers. So with this in mind, we've put together these webinars to try and answer all these questions for you. I'm joined today by a panel of three experts who've kindly given up their time to share their insight with us and answer your questions today. We're aiming for a runtime of about 90 minutes today, and I will try to keep us on time. And each of our speakers are going to give a short presentation, after which I'll be putting some of your questions to them. Uh, we don't want this to feel like a lecture series, uh, so we will try and have lots of time for questions, get through as many of those questions as possible, and we'll also be conducting a couple of polls along the way just to make sure you're all still paying attention. And remember, there will also be extra time at the end for more questions, so do make sure you stick around till the end of the webinar. Um, if you have a question, you can put your question in the Q&A box on your screen uh, if you're on Zoom at any time throughout please do use the Q&A function, uh, not the chat box for this, otherwise we might miss them. Uh, if you're on Facebook, you can also leave a comment and one of my colleagues will pick that up. Uh, if we don't get a chance to answer your questions today, either because we run out of time or because they're questions better suited to another expert or perhaps to one of our upcoming webinars, please be assured that we have read all of them and we will endeavor to answer them. As digital editor, I will be paying close attention today to your concerns and your questions, and that will be a big influence on the kind of content that I will be looking to create for the website and for our newsletters and our future webinars. So please do take this opportunity to let us know what's on your mind. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panel of experts. And again, a big thank you to all of them for taking part this morning. They're all very busy and they've taken time out of their schedules to be with us today. So first up is Peter Wakelin, who's a partner at Blevins Franks, a specialist in French tax, financial planning and wealth management. He is going to be giving us a really user-friendly overview of the French tax system. Uh, he's gonna let us know exactly what you need to know if you're thinking of becoming a French resident or owning property in France. Next, we have Anthony Bryan from award-winning French real estate agent Beau Village. And he's going to be sharing his expertise on the property buying process. He's also going to be talking about the current property market in France and, and everything you need to know about buying post-Brexit and during the pandemic. And last, certainly not least, we have Helen Harrop from French multinational insurance providers, Agence AXA International, who will be giving us an introduction to the French healthcare and social security system. And she'll also be talking us through the various health and other insurance needs for those moving to France. 
So that's more than enough for me. Uh, so let's go straight over to our first speaker, which is Peter from Blevins Franks. Uh, over to you, Peter. Good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, my task, as I mentioned, is to actually just provide you with a very basic initial overview of the French tax system and actually just trying to key on some key important areas that I think you need to be considering. Um, let's just start with a, a really important statement with regards Brexit and the end of the transition period um, with regards to the negotiated trade deal. The key message there, what was not included was a financial services agreement. That's really, really important in the mention of the fact that when you move to France, currently, if you have UK advisors and product providers, they are now, at the current time, unable to provide you any advice when you become French resident. So it's really, really important about looking at seeking advice from companies like Levins Franks and others who are both here in France and regulated and authorized to provide advice. So moving on then, just give you that initial background, some basics then. Um, on becoming permanently French resident, your uh, global sources of income become declarable on a French tax return. It's not about a choice. You have an obligation to file a French tax return. Also, you become deemed domiciled in France, which basically thereafter means assets then become subject to French inheritance rules and the tax liabilities that are applicable on them. Um, how these work in combination is a result around the actual French tax system and the, and, and the tax code in conjunction with the UK-France double tax treaty. The French tax year runs on a calendar year basis, January to December, with the ability on arrival on a split year basis. So for example, were you to become French resident today, September the 15th, what you would be doing on this year would be declaring only income from today until the end of December, and then annually thereafterwards. The other key difference is a point of reference is unlike the UK where individuals are self-assessed as individual filing, in France, if you're a married couple or have a formalized relationship, you actually file a single household tax return, combining all sources of income and assets as a couple on a single return. So let's just briefly go through what are the main taxes. Starting off with income tax, as he indicated earlier, all global sources of income become declarable and subject to French tax declaration. Pensions, that be occupational pensions, personal pensions, and UK state pensions and other state pensions, property rental incomes, and investment sources of income, all become declarable on a French tax return. Importantly, not all though, however, are subject to French tax. Some will actually benefit a tax credit if they remain subject to liability in, for example, the UK. Um, income itself then is then taxed in band rates on a through the system. Um, you benefit in the first instance what they call a zero rate band, which is effectively equivalent to providing what is the personal allowance in the UK. Um, so approximately the first 20,000 of income declared on a French tax return is zero rated and taxed. There afterwards, income is taxed in band rates. The first one being at 11%, moving to 30% and so on. So overall, the actual tax bands are much more improved compared to the UK with an overall, in theory, lower tax liability as a result of becoming French resident. What you can't do is very much in terms of mitigation of that tax liability with regard to pensions, because they are what they are, they're declarable. Where the key messages around what is available to help is about investment returns. Because unfortunately, investment returns, once declared, become subject to something called the recently, well, the last few years introduced flat savings rate, which is a fixed rate at 30%, combining income tax and also something called social charges. Unfortunately, the key also message to take into account is as a UK resident, you've no doubt been building up things tax efficiently in the UK, utilizing such services as premium bonds, ISAs, and alike. Unfortunately, all of those are lost benefits when you become French resident, and returns on such investments do become declarable and subject to tax. So that's a key message there in the income tax section about the importance of 
taking advice about how to restructure financial assets on becoming a French resident into something that is then going to be tax efficient for you on going forward as a French resident. Quickly moving on then, looking at social charges. Um, social charges, but for rule name, is attacked by a different name um, in, in reality to it. Currently, it's applied at a rate of 17.2% on investment returns and rental incomes. Um, so it is quite a significant, important liability. And again, with regards to investment returns, it shows the importance of trying to shelter those returns. Pension income benefits a slightly lower liability on social charges at a rate of 9.1%. Key also is important if you happen to be in receipt of a state pension and the ability to enter and gain something called an S1 form, it does provide some mitigation from the French social charges system. Namely, pensions become exempt from it and actually investment returns have a reduced liability from the 17.2%, reducing down to 7.5. So it's actually a useful tool um, holding an S1. Looking at capital gains tax, um, again, key difference in France between that and the UK is that there is no capital gains allowance. So you have the full net gain declarable and becoming taxable based upon the asset type. And they are different. So looking at firstly, things like equities. These include, of course, as we indicated, equity ISIS because they're no longer efficient, shares, investment portfolios and the like. Sales of any of those as a French resident, creating a gain will be causing a tax liability at the 30% rate. So again, it goes back to looking at the importance of looking at restructuring certain assets, particularly importantly, before you become resident in order to avoid the 30% capital gains tax liability, were that to be deferred until after you become resident. Property, um, again, if you look to sell a secondary property, um, it is subject to capital gains tax. Similarly, in the UK, um, in France, there are unfortunately two sets of liabilities, one the tax liability and two the social charges element again. From a capital gains tax perspective, the net gain becomes liable for tax at a rate of 19%. Thankfully, there is a mitigation on it, and it's based upon what they call a tapering relief. So effectively, it reduces the liability based upon ownership time, with the key message, any property owned more than 21 years then completely falls outside the liability of French capital gains tax. Social charges similarly has a tapering relief, but unfortunately, it takes much longer. It takes over 30 years to then taper out completely. The other key message in regards to it then is about secondary property on the UK. Um, it will obviously, if you sell that, become liable to both UK tax rules for capital gains and also declarable in France, with any tax paid in the UK benefiting a tax credit on the French calculation. Last but not least, in terms of the main personal taxes, is wealth tax. This was some fundamentally changed a few years ago. Um, and now the only assets that are included as parts of the calculation are physical bricks and mortar property assets. There is an allowance, which basically says 1.3 million is the threshold. So anybody owning property assets less than that has no wealth tax to concern. If the value of the property assets globally is over 1.3, there is a liability for wealth tax with the tax starting back at the rate of 800,000 and taxable in band rates. A couple of key important points. The French property, once you file a tax return from it, is deemed your principal residence. And at that point, it benefits a 30% reduction in the calculation. The other key point is about non-French asset properties. These are available to be excluded from the calculation for the first five years. So whilst wealth tax might not be an initial concern, it could though become quite a significant tax liability if you own multiple properties globally beyond the fifth anniversary. It does pose the theory about is retaining a UK property or a property elsewhere the right thing to consider long term when you think of the possibilities of what the virtual wealth tax liability could be coming into. <clears throat> 
excuse me. Um, that's the basic personal taxes. Um, the other key taxes that often get lots of conversation and is really important about planning is around inheritance and around inheritance tax itself. Two parts to that. First and foremost, let's look at the inheritance rules. Um, if you have children, children are protected heirs under the civil code and the civil thing, which basically means they are entitled without planning to receive a minimum percentage value of a parent's estate ahead of a surviving spouse, something that is completely foreign to normal things of people's wishes. So again, it's a key area that needs to be looked at because that would what would occur without doing some planning to mitigate. Um, made slightly more complicated and perhaps interesting in the short term, because what has been used quite regularly by lots of people is adopting a French will and applying UK law under something called Brussels 4 legislation. Um, the French government only a few weeks ago introduced new rules and legislation that is actually saying that they, as a country, retain the right to still apply French inheritance rules on French situ assets. And the biggest one normally for most people at that place normally is the property, of course. So it is a bit of a challenge because all of a sudden Brussels 4 legislation might not be the right solution to solve all the angles now going forward. And it's important, therefore, to look at what the implications of that are and to take proper advice in order to get to where you want to be. Moving quickly to the tax liability. Unlike most places in the world, UK included, if there is an inheritance tax liability, it's the estate that normally pays it, with the beneficiaries then benefiting the proceeds net. Unfortunately, in France as a resident, it's the beneficiaries themselves that have to pay the tax, not the estate. Um, just a key quick point there, and as a consequence, that can often be causing quite a problem if they don't have the funds, of course. Inheritance tax between spouses or those with a formalized relationship is zero. And that was only actually uh, moved to that point only a few years ago. Um, Thereafterwards, if you name beneficiaries, they pay the tax with the tax being determined by a number of factors, principally your relationship to them being the key. For example, if you bequeath to a child, a child can receive a benefit of 100,000 euros without liability to inheritance tax. Thereafter, they pay tax in band rates with the largest amount generally around 20%. And that's the best position. The worst case submission is if you were to bequeath any assets to an unrelated person. That includes stepchildren in that scenario, where they then only have a, an allowance free of inheritance tax of around 1,600 euros, with an amount in excess of that, they have to find and pay a tax liability at a whopping 60%. So it is a gauge of concern. So again, that whole area about mitigation of inheritance rules, trying to look at solutions to help keep eventual heirs, tax liabilities to a minimum is a key area for requirements and looking at advice. Um, just in terms of the other last point, the reference to it, um, as we say, advice generally, therefore, when you talk about things in terms of financially, is about tax-driven advice on becoming resident, but more importantly, about tax mitigation advice. It's about adopting and looking at strategies to help keep your personal tax liabilities to a personal level as low as possible, helping to reduce or eliminate the mitigation of the inheritance rules and therefore protecting surviving spouses. And last but not leastly, looking at trying to find ways to help keep the eventual heirs tax liabilities to a minimum, particularly if we were to suddenly find 60% tax bill, which I'm sure most people would be unable to actually pay. The key areas around it, as we've talked about, one of them is about restructuring financial assets, which can provide benefits in both reducing personal tax liabilities, but significantly help with the mitigation of inheritance positions as well. So that's really the most important things I've got to mention in, in, in about the tax review. Well, key messages I understand is, you know, everybody's situation is and will be a very basic overview. It's proper advice, particularly in timeline. 
because by definition, it is important to consider when is the right time to do I think we might have just lost Pete there. Uh, just bear with us, right. see if we can get him back. Uh, yeah. yeah, so I'll just say thank you for your time. And the real message about taking financial advice more than anything else, as I see it, is about then providing when you become resident, peace of mind going forward. So thank you for your time. Thank you for that, Pete. Uh, oh, he's back. We lost your video there for a second, but we yeah, still had your audio. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you, Peter, for demystifying some of those uh, tricky French tax questions. Uh, we're now going to put a few of your questions to Pete. Um, so first of all, from Linda, uh, does France tax military pensions from elsewhere when we don't pay tax at home? When you say military Oh, Pete, we've lost you again. Just bear with us, we'll see if we can get him back. Uh, Pete, do we still have you? Yeah, it seems to be the internet playing games a bit. Okay. Um, to, answer, to answer that, military pensions, um, generally speaking, always remain subject to tax rules of the country where the pension is paid from. So in reality to it, whilst you have to declare it on a French tax return, it is one of those things we indicated earlier that you will benefit a tax credit because it doesn't become taxable in France itself. Okay, great, thank you. And a question from Adam. Uh, Adam says, will a lump sum pension fund payout at retirement age be taxed in any way? He's, he's from Switzerland, if that helps. Okay, in general terms, depending on the nature of where the lump sum is. Uh, in the UK, for example, if you were to actually do- Oh, we've lost him again. He's just keeping us in suspense. I'm sure he'll be back with your- uh... With your answer, Adam, in a moment. Yeah, yeah. Generally speaking, yeah. Generally speaking, however, as a French resident, were you to take a lump sum out, it becomes taxable and declarable in France, um, either at a special fixed rate of seven point five percent plus social charges potentially, um, at the best rate, or at the full margin rate, depending on if you've never four. So it is declarable in France. Okay, thank you, Peter. Right, um, we've got one from, actually, I've got a couple here that I think are, are quite similar. Um, Tony says, if you buy a property in France, does that automatically make you a resident of France? And I'll just ask the other question as well, because I think they are quite similar. Lisa says, what taxes are applicable if you're a non-resident and own property in France? Oh. He's keeping us in suspense again, Peter. <laughs> there again. He is. Yeah, in reference to the question, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, just physically buying a property doesn't necessarily mean you become tax resident. Um, so in, in general terms, um, from a personal tax basis, it only becomes um, taxable on sources of income and assets and the inheritance rules if you then become permanently tax resident. And that's a different... Oh, we've lost you again. Pete? Yeah, no, the hey. only issue, yeah, the only liability that you would have in France by owning a property would be were you to let that property and create a French rental income. That in isolation would, however, still become declarable in France. But apart from that, nothing would be declarable unless you become permanently tax resident. Right, okay, great. That that definitely clears things up a little bit there. Okay, so we're going to stop there with uh, for the, with the questions for now, but we will be coming back to Peter with some more questions at the end of the webinar. So if we haven't answered your question or you still have a question, remember to drop that in the Q&A box and we'll put them to Peter at the end of the session. Okay, thank you for now. Thanks, Peter. Right, so before we go over to our, our next speaker, I'm going to put up the first of our polls. Uh, let me just find it. Here we go. So you should be able to see that on your screen now. Uh, and I'll give you a couple of minutes to answer it. So the question is, when are you looking to move to France? Uh, so you've got a number of different answers, under three months, three to six months, six to 12 months, or unsure. And I'll give you 
think it looks like over 50% of you have already answered very quick, um, but I will let you give you another minute just to let everyone answer. Okay. Right. Another five seconds in case you haven't answered. Now is the last time. Okay, let's end that. And so I'll put the results up on your screen. So rather unhelpfully, you've all said you're unsure. Um, but I suppose that's why we're here with these webinars to help you uh, decide on that. And hopefully if we can answer some of the questions that are preventing you from knowing when you're gonna buy your property, that should uh, help you out a little bit. Okay, well, thank you for everyone that took part in that. We'll have another little poll later on. And now we're gonna to go to our next speaker, which is Anthony Bryan from Beau Village. Uh, so over to you, Anthony. Hello everyone, wherever you are. Thank you for joining us. I'm just gonna share my screen with you. Hopefully everyone can see that. As you can see, my name's Anthony Bryan. I'm Senior Sales Manager at Beau Village Immobilier. I moved to France in 1999, uh, 22 years ago now, and I've lived in several departments throughout the Southwest since then. I started working with Beau Village about three years ago, having run my own estate agency for over 10 years. Buying a property in France is a big decision for us all to make. It takes courage, motivation, and a big leap of faith. In my experience, it will be probably one of the best decisions you will ever make in your life. Over the next few slides, I hope to show you how, with some careful preparation and knowledge, you can make this transition as easy as possible. And here's what we'll be covering. Choosing your area, finding an agent, searching for the right property, planning your trip and the documents you will need, making an offer and the buying process. A brief overview. Make a list of what you need from the area you live in. What is essential, what is non-essential. Examples of things that you may need versus what you want are, for example, Proximity to airports, schools, a local hospital, close to a town, or perhaps the type of geographic terrain that you're looking to find. Then decide on the items you are fixed on and those that are open for compromise. When I was planning my move many years ago, I visited several areas, firstly as a tourist, and then it didn't take me long to decide what I needed versus what I wanted along with the areas which were of interest to me from an affordability point of view, and I went from there. I then had a clear picture of where I wanted to live and could pose questions to agents based in that area uh, regarding what I wanted on my list. I looked for areas that had what I needed, and if they had some, some elements of what I wanted, then that was a bonus. The more you can discuss on the phone or via virtual meetings, the more efficient your time will be and the more the agent will be able to help you. Buying internationally is a different experience from buying in your home country. And nowadays, technology allows us to carry out a big chunk of research from our own homes before we even visit. Agents know their areas and they know their properties. Ask them the questions before you visit. Let us help you before you arrive in France. Book some online chat with those agents willing to help you. Agents cover different areas and have different personalities. Find someone that you can connect with, tell them what you want and let them steer you once they've listened to you. Searching for the right property. As with choosing your area, you also need to prioritize what you need from a property. As before, make a list of what you need from the property. And once you have a definitive list, make a note of the items you will or will not compromise on. For example, land size, the number of bedrooms, new build or old stone, open plan or not, the orientation, 
elevated with views, the list is endless. With this list, you, th you can then search online for properties. Video tours and live streaming are proving to be a valuable tool and most agencies have continued with this platform. If you have serious interest in a property, arrange a walkthrough visit online, which will mean that you can then decide if the property is the one you want to see in real life. You then save yourself time on the ground on your next visit to France and only need to view the properties that you have shortlisted. Once you're ready, you know your area and you know the type of property you want, you can start to plan viewing trips. Start to discuss properties with your agent and obtain as much additional information as possible. In my experience, viewing too many properties can be counterproductive. Today's environment dictates that you may need to show your means of purchase before viewing properties. Vendors are understandably nervous about allowing people unfettered access to their homes. It's essential that we ensure the safety of our clients and our agents. Therefore, being able to know that you are a serious client ready to buy now is much more important in the current health emergency. Plus, this will also put you in the best negotiation position. Also, speak to a currency specialist before your visit. They will be able to discuss options on currency transfer and help you ensure safe transit and an idea of your euro budget. What if you're not a cash buyer? If you need a mortgage to buy, then discuss options with your agent and broker before arriving in France. Here you can establish your affordability and therefore your budget. Get yourself in the best position possible to move on a property before you make that viewing trip. If you need to sell a property before you buy, then property viewings may be limited. Keep talking to your agent in this circumstance and stick to virtual viewings until you are in a better position to proceed. Agency fees are included in most advertised prices, but you also need to budget for the notaires fees. And these can vary, but if you plan on 8% on top of your purchase price, you won't go wrong. If you set your heart on a particular property, you shouldn't consider a reduction to the asking price without knowing the circumstances of the vendor. Some vendors may already have reduced their price to below market value to obtain a sale and a cheeky offer may cause you to miss the deal of the year. The time you spent building a rapport with your agent will now really pay. Your agent will know a vendor's motivation to sell. The agent's aim is to achieve a price that is fair to everyone whilst considering all of the circumstances. In brief, we won't let you pay too much. Now we'll take you briefly through the legal side of the buying process. Stage one. This is following a su successful property negotiation. Stage one, a pre-contract letter of intention to purchase is prepared by the agency and signed by both buyer and seller. This shows you are serious and means no gazumping can take place. It is time limited, allowing a period of time for the full legal process to take over. Stage two, the initial contract called the compromis de vente is drawn up and signed by the buyer and seller. This is different to the UK system of delayed exchange. In it, all the conditions of the sale or purchase are set out. Stage three, there follows a 10 day period of reflection during which time you as the buyer, but not the seller can retract from purchasing the property. Stage four, the notaire then makes the necessary checks such as local searches, legal compliance issues and guarantees and draws up the final contract called the Act of Vente. Stage five, the final stage is the signing of the second contract called the Act of Vente. If a power of attorney has been signed, the notaire can do this on either party's behalf. However, this needs to be arranged well in advance. 
how long does the legal process take? A normal timeline with everything running smoothly would be around four to five months from having an offer accepted to receiving your keys on the day of completion. That's it. Once the final act is signed and the keys are handed over, then the property is yours to enjoy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anthony, for that really comprehensive look at what to expect when buying in France. Um, we're going to go to a couple of questions. Going to get them up. Okay, so Megan says, are there house auctions in France? Uh, if so, uh, where are they listed and how, and how does it work? Yes, there are house auctions. Um, they are generally uh, repossession. It's not that people generally put their houses into auction. It's when a house has been repossessed by a bank um, and they can't sell it through the normal processes. Uh, they will go through what's called a commissaire priseur, which is a local expert and an auction house. And you can look on the websites of the commissaire priseur in a particular area that you might be interested in. Right. Okay, and another one is, let's have a quick look. Okay, in the current market right now, how long is it taking to buy? Uh, a little longer than it was before. Um, we used to work on a three to three and a half month lead time from offer accepted to completion. Uh, we're now looking at four to five months. So on average, if you break that down, four and a half months from offer accepted to completion. Okay, great. And one more. Uh, can you buy multiple properties at the same time? Uh, for example, this person wants to buy one for themselves and one for her mom. Absolutely. You okay. can do it on the same day, one act following the other. Ah, perfect. Can't get better than that. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Anthony. We're going to come back to you at the end with some more questions, if you'll kindly stick around. Thank you very much. And thank you to French, en French Entree for inviting me. Thank you. Right, um, we're going to go to another poll now. Um, and just before we get started on that, I do want to mention, because I think I forgot at the beginning, we are recording this session, will be sent out to all of you that uh, are attending, um, and it will also go up free to watch on our website. Um, so if you do miss anything, um, yeah, or you haven't been taking notes, don't worry, we, we've got you. Okay, right, I'm going to put the next poll up on the screen in just a second. Uh, here we go. That should be coming up on your screen now. So the question is, what is your biggest concern about moving to France? Uh, so there's quite a few options here. We've got healthcare, finding a property, uh, currency rates, mortgages, retirement or pensions, uh, concerns about the residency application and uh, COVID rules. So anything to do with COVID or the, the current situation. I'll give you a little bit more time to... Um, to answer, coming in, interesting, okay. There we go, okay, I think most of you have answered. Oh no, they're still coming in. So we'll give it another few seconds. Okay. Oh, still coming in. <laughs> okay. Right, I'll give you another five seconds to answer this if you haven't already. I'm not gonna do the countdown. Um, okay, right, let's end this poll and I will put the results up on the screen for you to see. So it's quite mixed. Um, the biggest concern seems to be a residency application, um, which uh, our experts today should be able to answer some questions. If you have specific questions or you can pop them in our Q&A. Uh, we do also have some content over on our website that'll be able to help you with that. Uh, next one is healthcare, which um, is good because our next speaker is going to be talking to us about just that. And then, yeah, pretty mixed for finding a property retirement. And nobody's concerned about the pandemic or COVID rules at the moment. So that's a, that's a good thing. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for taking part. I'm going to stop sharing that now. Okay. Right. So let's move on to our third and final speaker today, which is Helen Harrop from Agence AXA International. Uh, over to you, Helen. Hi, thanks very much. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, I'll just share my screen so you can see my presentation. So hopefully that's there for you now. 
Um, my name is Helen. I work for AXA in France. Um, insurance generally in France is on a very different basis than you may be used to and is um, very much more on a kind of individual basis. Agencies are quite individual for most agencies uh, for kind of insurance and banks and everything as you go from town to town. We're a dedicated English speaking agency based, based in France, working under the AXA umbrella. We're all native English speakers who work here together. We've got insure, experience in the insurance and banking industry from both the UK, Ireland, the US and, and other European countries as well. And we offer our specialist service for the whole of France. Me, me personally, I moved to France in 2013 with my family, my whole family, my children have been through the French health school system. I've had to learn to navigate the French systems myself and myself and all my colleagues have been through this journey and, and can use our experiences to help guide you and, and find the best way through. The French health system is something that causes people a lot of concern, I do know. It is a very different system to the one that most people will be used to. It's not free at point of access, as in the UK system and some other systems, apart from some exceptions, and that sums the system up as a whole, is, is what I would say. It's quite modular, and there are a lot of exceptions. But in general, the system, once you have your social security number, the French health system has a system where we can see the website it's all defined the french government have a strict list of all the treatments that they will reimburse and the cost a fixed set cost that they associate with that treatment it's a very long list you can access it but you know it's quite difficult to wade through and understand and the french government will then reimburse a percentage of that set cost Generally, this is 70%, but it's going to vary between 30 and 100%. This is 100% of the set cost. And the difference between the percentage that's reimbursed by the French system and the real cost is then covered by a mutual top-up insurance, but we'll come to that later. Um, the reason that this can become so complicated is that there are a range of private and semi-private and public clinics and your doctor or your specialist in many of these areas may, cho may charge more than the social security set fee. And so as we'll come on later, this is where you start to see multiples of, of percentages and it can get quite complicated. Just looking at a little bit of the jargon, Obviously, you've probably heard of a lot of this or you may come across it. So there is the carte vitale, which is the green card. And this is, I would call it the icing on the cake. Probably when you get this, it's a champagne bottle opening moment for most people, I believe. But it certainly was for me. It takes some time. And this is the card that you can use when you visit the doctor or the hospital or any of your practitioners. And it helps automate the system. Behind this, we have Amelie, which is the website which helps um, administer the system, and the attestation des droits, which is a statement of your rights, which really is the most important thing that you will receive. And you'll receive this before you receive your car vital. And once you have this and you have a social security number, then you have access to the French system. And this you may need to pay up front and, and this kind of thing, but you do have access. It's just a little bit more administration in order to, to get your reimbursements. And there's a system also known as the tiers payon. And this is where they have started to introduce where the third parties, such as the pharmacy or the radio, radio clinic that does x-rays, will charge the social security system and your mutual directly, and you don't have to pay up front, which is why I say it, it's a little bit more complicated than paying for everything at first, at first glance. The doctors are from your medicine traitant, which is your generalist, up to specialist consultants, and there are kind of specialist for each area. Just as a quick, I will come to this in a little bit more detail later, but um, the set, the French set fee for a doctor, general doctor's visit to your GP is 25 euros, and they'll reimburse 70% of that. Um, but there are some 
lots of kind of if spots and maybes that sit behind this you have to have a registered doctor you have, and they keep contributions but again in a nutshell the set fee for a doctor is 25 euros and you can have a dedicated doctor and you when you see your doctor you would use your carte vital and then they would send the reimbursements automatically back to your bank account so you often pay up front and then receive this later um the carte vital and the system will also cover hospital visits, hospital treatments and transport as long as it's all correctly administered. And another um, item you might come across is the ALD, which is Affection Long Durée. And there is a specific list of treatments which are considered to be long, um, long conditions such as diabetes, cancer, these are all listed and if you have one of these and your doctor officially assigns this to you then your treatment will be covered 100 percent by your car vital for everything that is related to that condition if you have an ald assigned and you have treatment for something unrelated then it's treated as standard so just to bear that in mind when you're registering for the French social security system, you may have heard of Puma, which is Protection Universal Malady. And this has been in place since 2016. And this basically states that everyone who lives in France and has been there legally and stably for at least three months is entitled to healthcare, everyone. And so people now apply in your own right. You don't apply as a family or attached to like a primary applicant. Everybody applies in their own right, as long as you have the right to live in France. And you would make this application through your local CPAM office, which is the case primaire assurance maladie. Now then there will be one of these in each department in the main prefecture town. And that is where you would make your application for healthcare. And to just, just briefly run through it, there's an application form that you would submit and you need to provide the evidence to support your application, which would be your identity, you need to support your residence in France, so your teacher de séjour, if that's applicable to you. Um, if you're working, then you would provide evidence of your work contract or your salaries. And if you're not working, then you need to provide the documents to show that you have been le living legally and stably in France for three months. And this would include um, information about your home, utility bills, etc. You get further information on that if required. You'll also, if you are born outside of France, need to supply a birth certificate and it's down to each individual prefecture CPAM office, whether or not they would require you to have that translated. And if your identity document shows a change of name, such as you've been married, you'll need to provide a copy of your marriage certificate also. You can add children using an additional form. Um, and they will also require supporting documents, but just brief, just to briefly so you can understand what you would need to provide. The Amelie website is a fund of so much information. I would always recommend people have a look there. And there are also some pages of English information and also on a website called CLICE where you can read about the um, French social security system in English and that's all been provided by the French government. Definitely recommend people will have a look at that. So just moving on to the insurance side of things, a mutual top-up insurance, as I said earlier, covers the difference between how much you have physically paid and how much you receive from the social security refund. So Going back to my example of a, a GP appointment, a GP appointment has a set fee of 25 euros. And I would say in most of France, a GP will charge 25 euros. But just bear in mind, there are areas, particularly Paris, where they will charge a lot more. From the French government, if you have uh, an assigned GP, a medicine traitant, you'll receive 1750. And then the French government keep one euro of that. So in your pocket, you would receive 16 euros 50. The one euro that they keep is called a forfeiture uh, contribution. So that's just basically everybody makes a contribution to the system. Um, and then so that you let end up with seven euros 50 out of pocket for that specific appointment. And that's where we then look at a mutual. The mutual is automatically linked to your social security account. So when you use your carte vitale, 
they will process the transaction and then they will automatically send all of that to your mutual and what they have paid and the mutual will calculate what you're due from them and send the money automatically to your bank account. So I would say 90% of the time it all works automatically once it's well set up. Hospital private rooms are something to consider. They're not covered by the social security. It's considered to be a luxury if you make that choice. And so therefore, if you want, if it's something that's important to you, you need to consider having a mutual which will cover that cost. And the cost can be anything between 50 euros a night to more than 150 euros a night, depending on the hospital and the clinic. Um, if you have inpatient treatment, there's also a daily forfeit associated with that, which is very much like the one euro forfeit for a doctor's general appointment, but that's 20 euros a night. And that is paid by a mutual. The other four phase are not covered by mutuals. It's considered to be a contribution to the system. But the exception is for hospital inpatient treatment. And a mutual will cover that for you. Um, the next item to consider is complementary treatments. Now, this covers things like um, osteopathy, um, homeopathy, things that are not considered um, conventional treatments and that are not covered by French Social Security, you can have a mutual which will cover payments for these for you. And again, these are the things you need to consider about what your priorities are and what's important to you. Most importantly for me, what a mutual provides is enhanced cover for private clinics and specialists. On a day-to-day -day basis, a specialist that charges to like double the set fee for an appointment may not be too much of an issue but if you then go on to need surgery or complex treatment this is something you really need to think about that it means that you have the choice of all the specialists and everything available to you if you have good cover and it's called another term that you may hear is dépassement des honoraires and this is where the surgeon will charge more than the government set fee the last thing that a mutual can provide are also additional services such as home help, pet care, study support. If you have to be admitted to hospital and you need some additional help and support, a mutual can do that for you and help arrange it for you before you're admitted to hospital. So always think to ask if that's a concern for you. Now, this is just looking at the range that we offer, but most of the mutual providers will also offer very similar ranges. So kind of just gives you an idea of what we're looking at. We can go from a very basic policy, which will offer hospital only cover. So it will only top up if you're admitted for an inpatient treatment. And I would just be it is a good policy and it's definitely worth considering, but I would always be make people aware that this doesn't cover any outpatient treatment. And you just need to take that into account even any if outpatient treatment in the hospital, it's inpatient treatment only through an economy option right up to 400 percent where we can look at it would cover in my example of a 25 euro general practitioners visit. It would cover right up to if that GP charged 100 euros um, and it also gives enhanced cover across the board. Um, there's also you can add options to increase the hospital cover on a basic policy, also for optical dental and also, for, again, for complementary treatments. Optical dental is also an area you need to think about. As in many countries, the real costs of optical dental treatment often outstrip the set fee by the government. Just as a, 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 an example, the set fee for a pair of glasses in France is five cents. So in effect, the French government do not pay for glasses. You will either pay out of pocket or you will have a mutual, which will meet that cost for you. And there is a program of government reform, which is called 100% Santé, 100% Santé. And this has helped to increase cover in those areas. And all good mutuals will offer you that option. Well, in fact, all mutuals will have an option to give you that cover. And certainly I would advise people to investigate it. Just to, if you weren't confused, just to give you an example to, to help you, hopefully help you understand how this can work. If, for example, you need to see a cardiologist, the BAS de remboursement is the set fee by the government. Now, the BAS de remboursement for a cardiologist is 51 euros. Now, 
in my example here, the cardiologist is going to charge 60 euros for their appointment. Now the social security is going to refund 3470. Now that's my 70% of my 51. And the government is going to keep 1% uh, 1 euro. Now, what's left at your expense then, if you have no mutual, is 25 euros 30, which as I say, on a, on a day to day basis, it's probably not that bad, but it can add up. Now, if you have a 100% mutual, then it's going to reimburse, as I said, 100% of the set fee by the government. So the mutual is going to pay the rest of the 51 euros. And then we're going to keep one for the government. So the mutual is going to pay you an extra 10 euros. And in that case, you're going to have 10 euros left at your expense. It wasn't 10 euros, but you're going to have 10 euros left at your expense. And with the 125, basically the mutual there is going to pay back 125% of 51 up to that amount. So in this particular instance, it would pay everything for that cardiologist, just the minus the one euro contribution. It is a little bit complex. It does take a little bit of time to get your head around it. But I hope that just shows you that by increasing the percentage of your mutual, you can increase your coverage if you want to see specialist consultants who may charge a little bit more. What we can also do, another concern for people will be insurance for when you first arrive in France. And now this can be a temporary insurance cover for the period when you arrive, between when you arrive and when you can receive your social security number, you may need this insurance to cover your visa application. For some people, it may be more of a long-term private solution that they prefer. Whatever your situation is, we've got different solutions available and we can look at that for you. The thing to, I just as a heads up for people is to think about pre-existing conditions that you've got and to think about that and how you're going to cover that period between when you arrive and when you're registered because many private solutions for that temporary period will not cover pre-existing conditions and so it's just something you need to to consider um, and then what we would do is look at your specific situations and find a solution that suits you the last situation we'll consider is if you're coming across to France to work, if you're going to be employed or you're going to be coming across and setting up as an employer or you're going to be self-employed, there are different things you need to consider. If you're setting up as a company, all companies are affiliated to a Convention Collective Nationale and this provides the minimum cover that you have to have and your company has to provide. Any, all companies with a minimum of one employee have to provide a mutuelle. So if you're working for a company, a French company, they are legally obliged to provide you with a mutuelle and it has to have the minimum requirements as defined in your convention collectives. So you've got quite good protection if you have a work contract. If you're in, if you have employees that are cadre, which is um, a level of employee who is considered a professional, it's a certain type of work contract, they must also be provided with a provoyance scheme, which is employee benefits. A provoyance provides death in service payments, payments towards short term illness and accident or long term illness, disability and, and pensions. And this provides support to the social security system, which in case of sickness often does not provide full pay. And this backs that up and supports that. And Definitely people who are coming over to be self registered as self-employed and need to protect their income should really think about this too. If you're creating a new base in France for employees, you need to think about offering mutual top-up scheme and also prevoyance, but also maybe consider private pension plans, which are now becoming a little bit more common in France to support the, the government scheme as that's changing and evolving. As an agency, what we want to do is make your arrival in France as easy as possible. And my specialism is health insurance. My colleagues specialise in insurances across the board, life insurance, routine car and health, home insurance. We can open a bank account from the minute you've signed a compromis de vente and help you have everything ready to be to kind of land, hit the ground running when you get to France and have your utility bills and everything set up and good to go. If you have any questions, you know, just get in touch and ask us. Um, thank you for your time. I'll stop sharing and hand back to... 
Thank you very much, Helen. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that very uh, comprehensive introduction to the ever complex French healthcare system. I'm sure that's- It is be... confusing, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure that's gonna be extremely helpful for anyone looking to move to France. Um, so a few questions for you. Um, first off, is health insurance or a mutual essential or compulsory in France? I know you already mentioned about for employers, but what about for everyone else? But for a private citizen, no, a mutual is not compulsory. It's just you need to think about, like all insurances, it's you don't need it till you need it. And a hospital stay can be expensive. And so I would certainly recommend that everybody investigates it and, and discusses their needs and what they need. But it's not a legal requirement for a private citizen, no. OK. Um, how quickly can I get health coverage in France? So in the case of applying for a social security number, you need to wait for three months before you can apply. Then it's down to how well you put together your dossier of application and the delays in your local office. And to be honest, that I've seen people who've had a social security number given within a month, but it's not unusual also to wait six months. So you need to factor that in when you're considering private insurance for that gap. Okay, yeah, and I remember myself when I moved to France, I was given a provisional uh, social yes. security number, and I think it then took me quite a long time to actually get my proper one but and my actual card retail. It's important to know that when you get your provisional number, though, you are covered by the system, so you okay. no longer necessarily need your private insurance. Okay. Once you have a provisional number, you can get yourself a mutual if that's what you want to do, and you can start putting in your expenses to the system using your provisional number. It's just, it takes a little bit longer and there's a little bit more administration involved. Okay, that's very good to know. Okay, so um, somebody else says, can non-residents get a social security number in France? No, no, it's definitely for, I think that there's a system for, if you're a French employee on secondment that you can still access your healthcare as a, a posted worker, but as a non-resident, no. You can use French health system, mm -hmm. but you will pay. Okay, okay. Yeah. And um, one more for you before we open it up to everybody. Um, with regards to the mutuals, can a mutual insurance company refuse to insure you? And if so, on what grounds and is this legal? No. The, the, the mutual is, is great in the sense that it, it's legally, they're legally obliged not to consider pre-existing conditions. It's very much based on an age bracket. The prices are, it will get more expensive as you get older. And there are some companies who have made a commercial decision not to offer some policies to certain age groups, etc. And there are obviously offers and such like. However, you should, everybody is uh, obliged to, and entitled to a mutual. And I know I can't speak for all companies, but I can speak for AXA, who I work for, and we offer insurance for everyone, no matter what the age or what the conditions. Brilliant, okay, that's great to know. Okay, so we've got lots and lots of questions, which I've been uh, saving as you've been uh, sending them in throughout this webinar. So we're now gonna open it up to the whole panel and I'm gonna put some questions to all of you. Um, I just want to check you're all still there. Uh, Anthony, do I still have you? Peter, do I still have you? Great. Okay. okay, Peter's still here in audio, but we won't be able to see his face. Um, no worries. Right. Before we get started with that, I'll just answer one question myself. Um, Carolyn says she has a trip planned with her husband uh, on the 5th of October, and she's struggling to find out the rules for traveling to France. She doesn't believe she needs a COVID test to enter, but how do I find a location to do a test before coming back to the UK? So, um, Carolyn, you're right that at the moment you don't need a test to, um, to enter France, assuming that you are vaccinated. Um, you can find all the rules on this on our website. We do keep them updated. We have a few articles. There's one uh, called Travel Between France and the UK. That's probably the one that's going to be most useful for you. Uh, we also have an article on the French traffic light system for travel, and we try and keep them updated. Um, for the latest on travel updates, do subscribe to our newsletter because I try to keep on top of it and always put the latest details in that. They are always changing. Uh, it's the bane of my existence at the moment. <laughs> so um, please do check the 
the, the latest requirements before you travel, even on the day of travel, because yeah, we can't guarantee it. Um, for COVID tests in France, they're very easy to find. You will have to pay if you're not a French citizen at the moment. Um, and if you are a French, sorry, a French resident, if you are a French resident, you will have to pay, I think from October 15th, um, but at the moment they are still free. Um, they're very easy to find. Most pharmacies will be able to point you in the right direction. And the easiest way, I'm gonna pop a link into the chat box for everybody. Um, she should be able to, oh, hold on, it's not working. Put that in there. Um, that is the link to santé.fr, which is the French healthcare website that, and the a search place where you can you can look for your local um, centre de dépistage, which is the, um, the local COVID test centre. So, um, right, now we'll get back to, to the other questions. So first up, a question for Pete. Uh, Mandy says, how is tax foncier worked out? Is Pete there? And for, yeah, uh, for those that don't know, tax foncier is the main property tax that is paid by the owners of properties in France, whether or not you're resident oh. or not, I believe. Yeah, well, by definition, tax foncier is much in the same way as in similar nature to UK in council tax. Um, there is a calculation based upon the size of the property, numbers of rooms. So it will vary from property to property. Um, and it will based on the calculation based upon lots of factors um, that includes those sorts of basic backgrounds. So what you will have therefore is different people having different levels of tax foncier, next door neighbors and all those things purely and simply because your property is different. Um, it, yeah, the nature of having an above ground pool or an in ground pool will affect it, for example. So there's lots of permutations that will all impact in what the final calculation is. So it's very difficult to be specific because it's about the individual property and what is part of what is forms of property. Okay, thank you for that, Pete. Um, so, Anthony, a question for you. Uh, Anya says there was no mention of surveys taking place. Is this something that is advised in France? Um, surveys generally don't take place in France. It's not something certainly the French buyers would undertake unless they might see a, a visible problem or have an idea there's a visible problem with the property. Uh, they, they are carried out, um, if necessary, uh, by an expert en bâtiment, or uh, there are certain UK surveyors that are based over in France that you can contact via uh, websites. Um, are they advised? If, if, the, if you see a structural problem with a property, then, then yes, they would be advised. Uh, they'll give you an idea of the cost of reparation if necessary, and whether there's an ongoing issue which needs to be sorted, or even it might put you off buying the property. Uh, you do receive a basic home buyer's surveys uh, upon uh, signing a compromis de vente or prior to signing the compromis de vente, uh, which tell you the state of the electrical installation, whether there is lead in the property, uh, whether there is asbestos, um, whether there are wood eating insects such as termites and, and the gas installation, things like that. But it doesn't give you a structural uh, overview of the property. That's totally separate. Okay, great. Thank you for that, Anthony. Um, Helen, a question for you. Um, let me just find it. Okay, so it says, my spouse is not yet in receipt of a state pension. Can they be included on my health care? I'm assuming this is somebody that's come from the UK and is probably... Yeah, maybe using an S1 form. Yeah. Um, this is where the Puma system has changed things, to be honest. When I arrived in France in 2013, I applied as a dependent of my husband because we came across with his job. That's not how it works anymore. So you are, will apply in your own right and show that you can support yourself. Unless you are actually um, a recipient of the S1, that sometimes happens that it's issued for the main and you can have a dependent on there, in which case you would use that for your application. Other than that, you would apply as a standard not working um, applicant and you'll just need to provide the evidence that you are le living legally and stably in France, your teacher de séjour, your evidence of your residence, your evidence of your income. So generally you will have to provide that to CPAM for your application. Okay, great, thank you. Um, okay, Peter, um, do the French tax Australian pensions? Uh, in Australia, they are tax-free. 
In simple answer, yes, unfortunately. Um, as you say, if you are resident in Australia, Australian superannuations as residents there are tax efficient, tax free. But unfortunately, they're just deemed as any other pension is, be it from Australia, the UK, or and French pensions in that it becomes declarable on a French tax return. Um, so one of the key messages perhaps as a consequence there is if you haven't already become resident and still resident in Australia, there is thought about maybe full fund withdrawing the pension, uh, which is tax free as an Australian resident, and then coming to France with the cash without the liability and then investing the cash in a tax efficient structure, which will then avoid the issues about pension income becoming taxable something that I've dealt with with a number of Australians, so familiar with those sets of rules. Great. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Anthony, another one for you. Uh, every time I find a property at the moment, it seems to have been sold. Is the property market really that fast? Okay, good one, yeah. Um, it is that fast at the moment, yeah. Um, we're in unprecedented times with the number of buyers compared to the number of properties that are on market and coming to market. Um, it's a common occurrence, you're not the only one. Uh, it's happening to dozens of clients on a weekly basis with us. Uh, they plan the viewing trip, they um, have a list of properties, and then that list of properties by the time they arrive has gone down from 10 to two. Uh, it's that quick. Um, it's 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 incredible, really. But one thing you can do, and something I don't necessarily advise, um, but if you do a virtual visit of the property, um, you can then get an idea if it's going to be um, the right thing for you, and it can make it come out quicker. That's all I can say. Okay, um, that's interesting because there was another question. Somebody said, "Do we need to see the property in the flesh in order to buy?" So I'm assuming we don't. Um, can you explain a little bit more about how that works? Um, yeah, since um, since the start of the pandemic, we've um, we've adopted and adapted to the situation in the way that we operate. Um, we are um, now able to conduct live video tours um, and e um, even three hundred and sixty tours, and people do um, strangely enough buy property without having. Uh, physically viewed it. Uh, it's happened to us on a number of occasions. It's continuing to happen because people are still finding it difficult to travel, uh, particularly from the UK um, because of the restrictions. So those that are desperately looking to purchase something are buying sight unseen and it is happening, yes. Wow, okay. Right, another one for Helen. Um, just find it. This is from Eric. Um, it says, regarding health insurance and mutuals, are there permanent plans that have a fixed price year after year, i.e. do not always increase as you get older, or do they always increase as you get older? I said that twice, but... <laughs> Fine. Um, no, um, they will increase because, they're, because there's no account taken for pre-existing conditions. The general can, feeling is, as you get older, your care is going to be more expensive and the plans do get more expensive year on year. Okay, um, so this one, um, so any of you really who have an idea about this, but maybe more for Peter or Helen, uh, Tony says, the elephant in the room, uh, post-Brexit, can a Brit still just rock up in France and decide to make his or her home there? I would, I would say yes. Um, the requirements for income are going to be different. You're going to be able to need to support yourself. Um, you can't, I don't think you can come across with an idea of, of just giving it a go in quite the same way that you could before. I don't know what the others think of that. Um, I think you need to have more of a plan and, um, and be more kind of organised with it and have the means to support yourself. Okay. Anything to add on that, Peter? Yeah, I just agree there. Of course, you know, people still can come without any requirements for this restricted 90 and 180 day, but anything beyond there, there is a rule and a requirement now for obtaining uh, either a long stay visa to stay beyond the 90 days. And that is at the point then when you're gonna start being asked questions. Do you have medical cover in cover? Do you have sufficient income? So it's not the same anymore. The rules are now different and it is about just making sure that you can 
pass the test basically about the visa application if you want to be staying yes. longer. Okay, right. So, yeah, it is still possible, um, but as always, there'll be a lot, lot more administration to uh, get through than ever before. Um, okay, another question for Anthony. Um, how often do people get the asking price in France and how flexible do prices tend to be? Um, asking price uh, is or sales is something we're seeing more and more of because of the activity in the market and how hot it is at the moment. Um, we often get um, a, a property that's had perhaps three or four people view it uh, in a short period of time and, and maybe three have offered on it. And, you know, obviously in, in those circumstances, the vendor's going to hold out for their asking price um, because uh, they, they see the market the way it is. Um, is it um, is it sustainable? I don't know. Um, we're seeing we've seen an increase in property prices over the last year, um, certainly as, as as regards the um, the statistics go. Um, so asking price sales are becoming quite common and quite normal. Um, sorry, what was the second part of the question? Um, it was whether or not people whether or not people get the um, sorry how the, flexible they are the price. Um, I would say that, yeah. yeah, I would say the longer the property has been on market, um, the less appealing it is, and that is often down to simple pricing. Um, so if it's been on the market a while, they, the, the, there might be reasons for it. The vendor might be very um, stubborn uh, to accept the fact that his house is overpriced. Um, however. Um, there may be circumstances whereby um, the vendor suddenly become, has the need to sell that property um, and therefore you can negotiate the price uh, sometimes quite heavily, um, although it's happening less and less now with, uh, as I said, the way the market is. Right, okay. So another question for Peter. Uh, if I become resident and pay tax on income in France, can I still have my pension paid into a bank in the UK and pay tax there? I'm assuming they mean... Yeah, paying tax on the pension in the UK. Do they need to pay it on the pension in the UK or in France? Well, in general terms, most pensions become declarable and subject to French tax. Where you actually get the payment paid into is largely irrelevant. It's about you being resident and the needs to declare it and be paying tax on it in France. Um, the only exception to that general rule in regards to pensions is if it's a certain type of government deemed occupational scheme, pensions such as police, uh, local authority, military and so forth, those you still declare in France, benefit a credit, but they still always remain subject to tax liability in the UK, but that's the only source of pensions. Right, okay, that clears that up a bit. Um, a question for Helen. Um, could you please ask Helen my... Okay, um, does AXA provide medical coverage for non-UK, non-French residents? And how difficult is it for a US citizen to become resident in France these days? You might not know with the second one, but... <laughs> yeah, I say for, for, the, for the medical cover for people visiting France, we do that we, we always have done that for people coming from all over the world it's things have changed recently for uk citizens obviously but yeah for you us citizens coming over we we can provide options for them while you're establishing residence and everything for 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 coming to live here i think um nothing's really changed for us citizens i think it's probably a little bit more difficult to travel with the covid protocols actually um but establishing residency I think it really remains the same. Would you agree? That it remains the same as it was as before. And again, it's the three month waiting period and then proving your residency. So the residency application is a separate issue, I would say. But once you've established your residency, it doesn't matter your nationality in applying for a French social security number as you've got across the board. Right, thank you. Uh, right, Anthony, um, I have a few questions here about um, notaires. So Tony, Lucy and Georgia are all asking uh, roughly the same thing. Um, who does the notaire work for? Uh, should you trust the recommendation of a notaire from an agent or seek one independently? Um, and yeah, should, do you advise bringing in a second notaire as well? Um, notaries work for, uh, they're essentially tax collectors for the government, so they're independent, 
Uh, they don't work for you as a person, although you might be paying their fees. Um, do you uh, seek your own? Um, it depends on, again, this is down to probably how you would be swayed by your estate agent. We're, we're on the ground. We know we have local knowledge. We know which notaires work well, um, which offer good advice, um, and which ones are efficient. Um, the, 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 the length of time to, to complete a sale at the moment is increasing um, week on week. And that's down to the burden on the system. And that includes the notary offices. So some of them are more efficient than others. Um, I would say if your agent recommends to go with a notaire or have your own notaire or go with the buyer's note, uh, vendor's notaire, then I would follow the advice of the agent in this circumstance. Thanks for your advice on that. Uh, Peter, if I purchased a property with a business, a JIT, for example, as a, as a growing concern, what are the tax implications? Well, assuming that you're going to operate the JIT uh, and, and create rental income from it, first and foremost, um, that in itself then is a rental form uh, and becomes then declarable and subject to French tax declaration. Um, and again, the only other complication dependent upon the locality of the sheet relative to the property uh, could be if at some point in the future an hotel deems these to be separate entities it could be that there is actually a potential for capital gains tax on the sheet if it's a separate building from the all main residence in the same locality so possible capital gains tax that's again very subjective um, depending on the location of everything. But definitely, if you're operating the business as a G, it becomes declarable as income on a French tax return and taxed in a number of different ways. Probably um, today is not the real location in terms of being able to go through all of those because there are a number of options, but it is declarable and taxable. Okay, great. Um, Anthony, which is the best structure to adopt if two couples want to buy one property? Okay, so that's, yeah, four different people buying one property. Um, depends on your, on the personal circumstances, um, but probably a notaire would look into that um, and advise you on it. Uh, there is a, a structure called an SCI, which is a, a civil um, it, a property company in France, and you can all be equal shareholders in that SCI. Um, and then upon uh, death of... of perhaps one or other of the um, of the partners um, their wills will take over and it will get then go to the people who inherit from them be that a partner spouse children um, other ways to do it you could buy all in, in division so there are four owners of the property um, likewise you all have a 25 percent stake in it um, and again the, the 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 inheritance laws take over once any one uh, of those four people were to, to pass away. Um, I would guess probably a notaire would be advising an SCI in those circumstances. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, Helen, if you own a holiday at home in France, can you register with a doctor to make things easier if you ever need to make an appointment? You don't need to register, to be honest. Registering uh, with a, a Medicine Treton is something you need to do for your social security registration and your reimbursements. But as a visitor, you can just make an appointment and go and see a doctor. Um, oh, there's a very good website called Dr. Lib. There's a few websites out there where you can just look for a free appointment with a local doctor. You don't have to be registered to go and see a doctor. Um, it, it might kind of, it's, it basically makes it more easy to get, it gives you the full reimbursement in the French system, but you can just go and see a doctor. I've done that like with my parents when they visited, you just have to pay up front. That's the main difference. Okay, that's really useful to know. Um, so a question for Peter. Uh, I want to take a lump sum of my private UK pension. Is it better to take it before I move to France? Yes is the answer. Um, generally speaking, as we indicated uh, slightly earlier with the Australian one, is UK, as a UK resident, you normally have the ability to take a up to around 25% tax free. Um, that would be lost as an option if that was not done before you move to France, because anything that you take out as lump sums or income flow or any other format 
as a French resident becomes declarable and subject to French tax. So yes is the answer. It's very important to look at as one of those options as we were talking earlier about the timeline, about doing certain things before you move and therefore that's a key one of one of those things that's really important to consider. Great. Okay, uh, Anthony, we'll do one last question for everybody and then we'll wrap this up because I'm quite conscious of time. Uh, so Anthony, what are the best questions I should ask an agent? Um, how long has the property been on market? Is always a good one. Um, have there been any previous offers on a property? I'm, I'm presuming that you're you're interested in a property and what you should be asking about it. Um, and uh, how long? Uh, um, sorry, have there been any price reductions? Um, if you're just in general discussion with your agent, then you need to look, find out how well they know the area. So it, it, again, it, it boils down to what particular to. So. Oh, are you still uh, with us, Anthony? If you can still hear me. You're just breaking up a little uh, bit. My internet connection's unstable. Yeah. yeah, sorry, unstable internet connection. Um, so what questions to ask a, a, an agent? Um, yeah, find out how much the agent knows about it. If this is you prospecting to find an agent, what drove them uh, to move out to France? It's often a question I get asked. Uh, why did you move or why did you make the move and why did you select the area you moved to? Um, and, it, and, and that will sort of give you an insight and, and perhaps point you in a specific and particular direction as to why and where you're looking for property. Great. Thanks for that. Um, final question for Helen. Uh, if I have a pre-existing health condition which has been diagnosed in the UK, can I still get cover when I move to France? Um, on a temporary basis. As, as I say, that's going to be difficult. There are some specialist providers out there for that, but I think you just need to prepare for the fact that there is a, a difficult period while in the transfer, because um, a lot of temporary insurance providers are going to decline to cover pre-existing conditions. Um, once you're in France and you're talking about continuation of care, then yes, you might find that um, specialists want to revisit things and look at things again from scratch. But yeah, continuation of care, I would say, is, is pretty good. It'd be a case of, I would start with your GP, I would discuss your concerns and your treatment and current plans, and then start looking for a specialist that suits you. Because the system is quite modular and quite private, you can, if you're not happy with your consultant that you kind of start with, you can easily move around and find, find somebody that you know, is, you're happy with and you kind of work with on, on a good basis. Great, thank you. And final question for Peter. Uh, is any, I'm assuming this is for somebody who is resident in France for tax purposes. Uh, is any amount drawn from an international investment taxable? Um, in the most instances, yes, unfortunately. Um, and that's because most of the international investments, be that in the UK or elsewhere, um, don't have the ability to provide an appropriate French tax certificate on the gain element covering the French tax rules in order to it to be um, tax efficient as a French resident. Um, so it goes back to what we were talking again about the timeline and looking at what it is you have, is there things that you ought to be considering about restructuring certain assets, financial ones being particularly important, because again, lots of them should be dealt with and restructured in part before you move to avoid the tax liabilities because after moving you're then going to get caught in exactly this position where you have an investment structure that if you do anything with is likely to cause you a tax liability as a result of being a French resident. Right okay so it really is highly recommended to seek advice before you make the move to France. Okay, well, we're gonna wrap up there. Uh, we're bang on time, if I can just get through this uh, little outro quickly. Uh, that's all we have time for today. Uh, thank you very much to all of you who attended and thank you very much to our panel for giving up their time and answering all your questions today. 
Uh, if we didn't get around to your questions, please do keep an eye on the French Entree website over the coming months. Um, we will be looking to put these into articles or um, other content on the website. You can also put any additional questions to us at webinar at frenchentree.com. If you enjoyed today's webinar, if you found it useful, uh, don't forget to sign up to the second installment of this webinar series, which is taking place on October 14th. Uh, in that webinar, we'll be focusing even more on the process of buying French property, and we have another expert panel, including currency exchange specialists, legal advisors, and wealth management advisors. So you can sign up for the next webinar over on the website, and while you're there, don't forget to register as a French Entree member, and also sign up for our free weekly newsletter, if you haven't already. And finally, do let us know what you thought of today's webinar. Uh, did you enjoy it? What can we improve on? What topics would you like us to see us cover in upcoming webinars? Uh, you can drop us an email at webinar at frenchentree.com, or if you're quick, pop it in the chat box before we end the webinar. Um, so that's it. Thank you again to everyone for attending. Thank you again to our panel, and I will hopefully see you all on the next webinar. Enjoy the rest of your day or evening, wherever you are in the world. Thank you.